Wonderful. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, we've already been sending welcomes out via the chat function. Uh, you'll see the chat icon, icon at the bottom of your, um, your screen there. Feel free to say hi, to ask questions, especially to leave questions that um, we can get around to um, in the Q&A session at the end. Uh, let people know where you're from. Um, and uh, just in general, that becomes the other dimension of the meeting. Um, so, uh, first of all, as always, um, I want to start out with uh, a welcome and thanks. So, thanks to um, Alec Julian, who once again is acting as engineer producer and is in his own right a wonderful typographer. And we're going to see some of his work later on. And to Patricia Julian, uh, not no relation. Um, who composed the music that you heard, our great theme music. And thanks also to everybody who has um, contributed and supported uh, this Zoom series and the work of the Endangered Alphabets. This, uh, this um, support is vital. Um, it, it's, it's virtually all of what keeps us going is individual no donations. And we really hope that you'll feel Sufficiently moved to help us, we'll give information about that at the end. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to do today is something that I've wanted to do really for several years since I um, first started the Endangered Alphabets project, which is I want to pay tribute to the, um, the kind of groundbreaking or, or pathfinding people who, roughly speaking, 20 to 30 years ago, first began doing typography and digitization in uh, non-majority writing systems. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking of Jason Glavy, Michael Everson, Andrew Cunningham, Andre Rovenchak and Chuck Riley, um, Anshu Pandey um, involved in a huge number of Unicode proposals, uh, Debbie Anderson at the Script Encoding Initiative. Um, if there were a Hall of Fame for today, you know, they would be the Hall of Fame and probably other people I don't even know about. They were like that first generation. Um, so the next thing I wanna do is to uh, come up with the uh, acknowledgement that I am not a graphic designer or a type designer or a typographer. Um, I'm also not a linguist or an anthropologist. And so, uh, in some respects, I am the worst person possible to be in charge of this project. But I have to say, by being um, an outsider and by coming in from an unusual angle, um, it's given me a variety of uh, insights that um, many linguists might not have had because they are moving in their own territory. Um, and so what I wanna do first of all today, um, I think we're actually second of all at this point, what I wanna do second of all is to um, show you some examples of um, type design and innovation that are being done in non-traditional um, scripts or non-mainstream scripts. But I wanna explain why I'm showing this. So as we move into this extraordinary period of revitalization of writing systems, which is absolutely happening all over the world, not uniformly, but it's certainly happening, then one of the things that happens when a calligrapher or an artist or a type designer gets involved is that that writing system, that endangered alphabet, that script, changes its identity and it changes the way it gets presented to the world. So if the only way that you as a member of an indigenous or a minority group see your traditional writing system is in a museum or in an old book or in an inscription on a vase or um, carved on a buffalo jawbone, it feels as if that's part of the past, which on the one hand, connects it to your identity and your cultural identity, but on the other hand, it makes it feel dead. So 
I'm really interested in people who are exploring and experimenting with new expressions of traditional writing systems so that they don't feel dead. They are suddenly a playground, an artistic area, an easel where people are coming in and um, someone needs to mute their mic, I think. Um, uh, where all of a sudden it's alive, it's, it's, it, it's expressive because language and writing are alive. They change all the time. New stuff comes in. And one of the things that these uh, new workers in traditional systems are doing is showing that to be true. So we're going to look at a, um, a, a few examples of this, not all of them by any means. Um, and I want to say a few words about each of them. Um, as we go. So we're going to go into a slideshow now. Okay, so um, this is the work of uh, Ridwan Ridoy. Um, so this is Siloti Nagri. Um, so the uh, Silet is a division of Bangladesh um, and its people are a, a separate ethnic community whose writing system and whose language have really been kind of overrun by the state language, uh, which is Bangla, and the Bengali script in which is written. So to see somebody um, writing in uh, Siloti Nagri, and also doing so, you know, with a, with a calligraphy pen, using it in this expressive way, it really sort of says, okay, welcome. We are here. We never went away. We may have been quiet for a while, but we, we are here. And I think that's a vital message to give right now. Okay, moving on. So this is the work of Magis Madi, and um, he is um, Amazir, um, and is uh, living in Canada, I believe, and is a wonderful um, calligrapher. You can see his uh, YouTubes on that, but he also is a type designer. By the way, all of this information about these various designers, calligraphers, artists, etc., is going to be included in the post mail that I send out to all of you after the show is over, and um, and you've made your you made your commitment to supporters. So obviously this is the Google Doodle, but it's in Tifanoff, the, the Amazir script. And he has included over there on the right the Yaz, the um, Amazir letter and the Amazir flag, which we talked about last time. Um, and it is it has those Google qualities of being um, sort of colorful and cheerful and approachable. And it's also one example of something that a number of type designers are doing, which is to reappropriate a commercial icon. Um, and so uh, someone somewhere is probably doing a collection of, of Pizza Hut logos or Starbucks logos in different uh, writing systems from all around the world. So it's a kind of subversion that's going on. And moving on to the next one, uh, this is also Tifana. This is also the work of um, Magis Mahdi. So one of the things that's happening in Morocco right now is they are producing the first range of children's school books in the Tifana script. And so what he's decided to do is to create a version of this. This is obviously like chalkboard Tifana, which is, um, it brings the script together with its audience which I'm sure is like 101 in um, sort of type design and you know this stuff already, but it's great to see it in action and to realize that if you're gonna revive a writing system, you have to revive it as a means of expression as opposed to simply as a standard font, which of course is what a lot of people are working on all over the world right now. And then the next one is the third of our, um, examples in Tifna, and this takes a very interesting risk. So this is the work of Mohamed Gwensat, who's uh, in Marrakesh, in, in um, Morocco, and um, Tifna is typically written in all 
rather block uh, uppercase capitals with um, uh, other sort of diacritical marks. And what um, Muhammad is doing is to say, let's have a cursive form. Let's have a cursive form of um, our traditional alphabet. And when you do that, you run a risk. So on the one hand, you're saying, this is alive, this is expressive, and here's what it could look like. This is one person's view. But on the other hand, people are, other people I know, because I've had that conversation, are saying that letter does not exist in our script, in our traditional script. And the very deep connection between a culture and its writing system is what makes people want to revitalize them, but it also legislates a little bit against change or experimentation. So there's always, I think, going to be this tension between maintaining the traditional identity that is the roots of the people and doing something that's sort of new and interesting, exciting, that may also annoy people. Okay, moving on. So this, unless I am mistaken, is the work of somebody who is actually in our meeting today. Um, and um, uh, so I'm not sure whether you go by Sebastian or whether you go by your full name. Um, can you uh, just, like wave us a hi. Um, this is uh, someone coming present. Yes, great, excellent, good. So um, just say hi to everybody. Unmute yourself and say hi. Hi everyone, how are you? And are you in Zimbabwe at the moment? Yes, I'm in Zimbabwe at the moment. Great, so when we get to the Q&A period, I really hope you'll come back and tell us more about this project that you're doing where you're kind of reinterpreting a variety of traditional African scripts because I think this is wonderful. Okay, so we'll talk to you uh, more sure, in just a minute. Sure. Great. And what I also love about this particular piece of work is not just this, uh, this wonderful kind of um, elaboration within the letter, um, but the fact that the alphabet that he's chosen to work with, Mwangwego, is uh, um, by no means a mainstream, mainstream script. It's, it's a minority script that was actually created by an individual, Nolens Mwamwego, who, who it's named after, um, who is still alive, who is still advocating for his, his script and teaching it. So what we have is really both ends coming together. We have somebody who has created a script for his people and his culture in the hope of revitalizing both. And then somebody else who's coming in and saying, I am going to bring my creative energies and my vision to this as well. Um, and these are the things that, as I say, they make it seem not only less of a minority um, script, but also less of a something that happened in the past. It's something that is alive right now and an opportunity for, uh, for creativity and life as language is and always should be. Great. Okay, moving along. Um, so I don't think Ananda is with us on this because it's probably like two o'clock in the morning um, in Kathmandu. So this is the work of Ananda Maharjan, um, who is Nepalese, um, uh, lives in Kathmandu. And this is uh, really, really interesting to me for a couple of reasons. So uh, this is a, a traditional um, Nepalese script called Ranjana, and um, it has always been used in this really elegant, bold um, display font kind of fashion. Um, even uh, when the content of, let's say, for example, a book or the, the small print on a movie poster would be in uh, one of the other uh, Nepalese languages or even in the Devanagari script, there was this beautiful Ranjana explosion um, at, at the head. And this is a particular form of Ranjana where it's, the letters are kind of brought together or stacked in a monogram instead of being written out sequentially. And I love the idea of experimenting with new ways, uh, well, it's not a new way, but experimenting with ways of um, 
bringing together and aligning and combining script um, for these purposes. And we're going to see some examples of those when the slide shows over. And the other thing is, if you turn your head sideways, you can see it says calligraphia. And that is an organization that has been started just recently to reintroduce the traditional scripts of Nepal, um, which were sort of the target of a vendetta for a hundred years or more. Um, having been the official scripts of Nepal, then there was an entire dynasty that um, uh, essentially drove them underground. So what we're seeing now is the beginnings of a revival. Um, so uh, to calligraphia, um, you know, all my best wishes. Plus, when you're looking at this as, as a designer, don't you just love the texture that, that he's got in the, in the paper, which produces that wonderful kind of uh, rippled gold effect there? Okay, moving right along. So one of the things that um, is absolutely undeniable is that the world headquarters right now for the typographic revival of traditional writing systems is Indonesia. Um, so there are several organizations, mostly based in Jakarta, that um, are working not only to revive the the sort of the central Javanese script um, or the popular, once popular Balinese script, but even to go out into the islands of which there are 17,000, many of which have their own local scripts, many of which are um, endangered to the point of virtual non-existence. And this is one of those. So the design is uh, by uh, Ridwan Morlana who, um, is uh, a designer who's done uh, dozens of different Indonesian scripts. Um, and as you can see, this has a lovely sense of movement and character in it. And the Bima script, as it says at the bottom, um, very, very much a minority one. So this is a real difference between trying to create a potentially commercially viable script so that it might be adopted by a multinational corporation wanting to do business in Indonesia, for example, and wanting to create a font for a minority script as a way of recognizing these people, this culture, respecting them, wanting to give them um, a, a place in the public eye. And the next one um, is also from Indonesia. Um, so this is, um, another real minority script, Rajan, um, and uh, it is from um, Southern Sumatra, I believe. And um, so this is, a, as you can see, this is, this is being executed in a really kind of um, educational way. You know, we have the script, we have the pronunciation, we have the name, we have the photo. But the thing that you probably don't know is that the Rajan script is, is, is an incised script. Um, and so in order, so that means it typically doesn't have a whole lot of stroke, stroke weight or variety. So what we're seeing here is the work of Dandy, Nafalzak, Hadli Rahman. And um, what he's doing is he's really giving sort of life and movement and flow to a script that otherwise might be a little angular and sharp. And he's doing so because this is his people, um, which I think is, is, is just a spectacular thing. Um, and uh, so now we're gonna move on to something a little different. So this, uh, you know, what happens if a people do not have their own writing system? And um, so the indigenous um, ancestral people of uh, Northern Vermont, where I live and where it is unbelievably hot right now. So if you hear a noise in the background, it is the birds fighting over the bird feeder because I've got all the windows open. Anyway, um, the ancestral people are, are the Abnaki. Um, and uh, that raises a really interesting question. If you write the Ab and some words in Abnaki and you're using a standard European font, are you uh, using the 
uh, the, the writing system of the oppressor? And is there not some kind of clash there? So um, I got together with um, uh, somebody I just met who was Abnaki, who put me in touch with uh, several other Abnaki, and we brought in Alec Julian, who is, as I say, acting as producer and um, engineer on this Zoom, um, because Alec is also a typographer. And so what we decided to do was to have the Abenaki present Alec with a number of examples of their artwork. Um, a lot of it is uh, beading and decoration on clothing, for example. And what he realized was that that kind of hook or horn shape, which you see at the bottom, uh, at the top of the W there, and the bottoms of the Ks, was a, a sort of a consistent feature in, in much of their artwork expressively. And so he designed the first custom Abenaki font, and um, which I used then to carve this. This says Wabnakiak, which uh, we would say is Abenaki, but literally what it means, it's their name for themselves. It means people of the dawn lands because their territory extended to the uh, easternmost region of this larger Indian confederacy. So they were the ones who lived more in the east. So Wabanakiak means people of the Dawnlands. Um, and this carving is now hanging in the Lieutenant Governor's office in the State House in Vermont. Um, obviously, as a non-native carver, uh, it's not indigenous. And Alec is also not Abenaki, so it's not indigenous. But this is us doing our best to at least address these questions of how do you create a writing system for an oral culture that did not have a writing system that nevertheless feels at home. Because as we've said many times on this series, the thing about writing is that it feels, your writing system feels like home. This is where you are, this is a sign you belong. Okay, moving along. Um, so this is not, in fact, type design at all. This is calligraphy, but <laughs> I just had to get this in here. So this is Mongolian calligraphy. Mongolian calligraphy is a world intangible heritage. And um, up until very, very recently was severely endangered. Um, it's extraordinarily expressive. The Mongolian script is a vertical script and each letter, sorry, each word no matter what the letter, the initial letter is, begins with a certain kind of flourish. And likewise, it ends with a certain kind of flourish. So there's actually a, there are three different versions for each letter, an initial, a medial, and a final. And the initial and the final all have a degree of flourish about them. And what that means is that the script is inherently calligraphic. You execute it in such a way that you go in thinking artistically and you leave the, the word with an artistic flourish. So as you can see at the bottoms of these vertical words, there's this wonderful down and up swoop that's going on. How you would convey that typographically with that kind of wonderful sort of breakup um, uh, effect, I don't know. But nevertheless, there are Mongolian um, fonts that are now um, resurfacing after many years of uh, neglect and abuse. And the good news is that the Mongolian script is gonna be taught in schools in Mongolia um, starting in a few years time. So there's a revival story going on right there. And then speaking of doing things differently, the next one, you can even do it on socks. So this, um, this is a photo from Instagram from Adinkra Republic. So the Adinkra Republic um, apparel company based in Ghana and in New York takes traditional Adinkra designs and weaves them into really sharp looking socks. If we can go on to the next slide, you'll see what, that's what the actual Adinkra symbol looks like. This is Aya, the fern, which stands for um, um, Re resilience and uh, creativity. And then, Alec, if we could go back to the sock, there you can see the fern is tucked into the socks. Um, 
uh, in, in, in another kind of script revival sort of fashion. Okay, so um, thank you for the slideshow. That's, that's kind of probably what you all expect at a, at a lecture. And now I wanna do something um, really very different. Um, because as I say, I'm not a graphic designer, I'm not a type designer, but in working on the Endangered Alphabets project, um, I have come to notice certain things that I think raise some really interesting questions for me and, and maybe come out of left field sufficiently to raise questions for you. But before we do that, I don't want to forget, um, if you are working as, um, if you're working in creating design in your traditional endangered alphabet, please contact me because I want to be able to feature your work. Likewise, if you know other people who are doing that, please pass me their uh, names and information so I can contact them. My aim is to do a monthly feature on the website in which we look at the work of somebody who is really bringing back to life and, and, and bringing their own individual expression to um, indigenous and minority writing systems. Okay, so deep breath, drink of water, just one second. Okay, so when I've had conversations about the Endangered Alphabets Project, what I've noticed is that the kinds of question people ask me um, vary enormously. And, and it may sound as if I'm, I'm sucking up to all of you out in the audience, but this is absolutely um, true. The most interesting questions are asked by designers because designers ask the question of a writing system, not like, oh, um, typologically, how does this fit in? Is this part of this family or that family? Or, um, you know, how are the individual morphemes expressed as graphemes and stuff that I don't frankly understand? Designers ask what I think is a really, really, really interesting question, which is, why does this writing look like that? Which is part of a broader question, which is, what should writing look like? Speech is invisible. I guess, we, you know, you can read lips, but essentially the product of speech, it does not have three dimensions. It's not visible. The whole notion of representing it in a visible fashion, in, in something solid, is a huge translation. And so the question of how do you do that, how do you do that effectively, is one that we pretty much never think about because especially in the West, we, we're used to seeing it happen. And um, I had not thought about this at all um, until I began the Endangered Alphabets Project. And then, I started stumbling on things. Basically, that's my research method. I head in not knowing anything and I stumble on things. Um, and so I'm just gonna show you a couple of things and then explain the virtue of stumbling. So first of all, I'm just gonna move on to camera two and walk you around the extremely hot headquarters of the Endangered Alphabets Project. And in particular, so we're gonna go over here we're gonna go past the bunny cage. And as you can see, those of you who haven't been here already, there is a certain amount of stuff on the walls. And we are gonna to focus today on this one here. Okay, so, so I don't have to stand here forever. Alec is gonna replace this with a slide. Okay, good, now I can go and sit down. Okay, so. This is Samaritan. This is Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the Samaritan script. And I won't tell you anything about the Samaritan script just yet. What I'll tell you about is what it was like to carve this. And the answer is it was very disturbing. So I go into this project. This is right back in the beginning when I was doing my first exhibition. I went in knowing pretty much nothing about any of these scripts. And as I was carving this, I kept thinking that there was something wrong. 
And then the phrase Sherlock Holmes kept occurring to me and I couldn't figure out why. And eventually I realized that I was thinking of the case of the dancing men. So this is a Sherlock Holmes story in which um, one set of villains is sending messages by code to another set of villains. And um, the code is sort of like a semaphore, they're stick figures and they're, you know, the hands up or down or sideways um, uh, represent different letters. But the thing that fascinated me about this was the letters were not level. So if you notice the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seventh and the eighth character, the eighth character on the top line looks like a comb or an M or something like that. And it's not horizontal. It's at a slant. And then if you keep looking to your right, um, the one, two, third character to the right, it looks as if it's going to fall over. It, it looks as if it's standing like a person with a hat leaning forward about to fall over. And then the one next to it, it looks as if it's like a Z, but it ought to have a flat bottom and it doesn't. And likewise, and the more you look at these, you start realizing um, this is violating one of um, the, my sort of cherished un, unconsidered assumptions, which is that writing should stand up on its own. It should have this kind of um, robust quality that suggests um, permanence, that suggests balance. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. And so you may ask the question, so why don't the Samaritans change their letters to, uh, as indeed, you know, um, Arabic has been simplified, Chinese has been simplified, you know, why, why don't they um, make their writing uh, more normal, you know? And the answer is because it is the handwriting of God. So the Samaritans are related um, to the tribes of Israel. And um, if you go back to Exodus chapters 31 through 34, then Moses goes up to um, Mount Sinai and God writes the, the 10 laws that become the covenant on stone with the finger of God, right? So this ex explicitly says with the finger of God. So what we have then is not only a metaphor for writing as a means of establishing the, uh, the basic fundamental principles of civilization, we actually have something really quite specific, which is this is the handwriting of God. So when, um, uh, when the Israelites are uh, exiled into Babylon, their writing and their language change. The Samaritans, being a different people, do not undergo that fate. And so when the return takes place, the Samaritans um, have this attitude. They call their writing ancient Hebrew, that theirs is the original Hebrew. This is, this is the stuff that, uh, that is the handwriting of God. So, and of course, this doesn't make them very popular with the Israelites at all. Um, so you don't change your handwriting. You don't change your script if it's the handwriting of God. It is holy. You don't do that. But it's very interesting, therefore, that that script represents, it kind of violates certain assumptions and prejudices that we have about what writing should look like and why. So now I'm going to go back to this camera. And, oh, there we go. There we have. Alec is like the fastest person in the world with a meme. Yes, there we have um, the, uh, the dancing men from the Sherlock Holmes story of the same name. Nice work. Okay, so now we're gonna go across the room and have a look at another carving. And that's this one here. So this, you've seen several examples of Tiffin art before, and this is um, a different one. So this is, again, the version of Article One of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that I carved for my uh, first exhibition. And you may ask yourself the question, why is it meandering all over the piece of wood? You know, why can't you write it or carve it in straight lines? And the answer is that when I first saw writing 
in Tifana that was daubed on the wall of a cave in the Sahara. This is deep Sahara, along with um, paintings and drawings of animals that um, certainly don't live there anymore, uh, giraffes, um, cats. This is what the writing looked like. This was, if you like, again, the hand, if not the handwriting of God, this is certainly the handwriting of the ancestral um, uh, pre, uh, precursors of the, of the, of the Amazigh people. And again, you look at it and it looks wrong. You know, you say to yourself, um, all right, it looks, when you write it like that, it makes it look kind of childish or primitive or whatever. And I have to say, um, and again, if you're interested, please go on to chat and say, yeah, I'd love to see that photograph you're talking about of the writing in that cave, because when you see it meandering around the wall, it looks like a strand of DNA. It looks like the DNA of writing itself. It, is, it, it ma makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It's absolutely extraordinary stuff. And I can send you that link. Um, okay, so what those two examples do is to show that writing has often happened in ways that are not linear, straight line, parallel. Um, so for example, early on in um, the ancient Greek tradition, they used a technique called boustrophodon or ox turning, where they would go along like an ox going to the end of a furrow and then turn around and come back in the other direction, which makes actually a lot of sense because it means you spend less time with your hand not doing the writing. Um, in Indonesia, um, in the uh, Bugis tradition of Lontara writing, um, when they filled a page with writing, then they would turn the page through 90 degrees and keep writing in the margins until the margin was full and then keep turning it. So um, it's that the pages look absolutely glorious. They, 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 they're, they're sort of delirious with geometry. Um, and so the last thing I want to talk about today is this notion of where do we get our assumptions about what writing should be like from. And um, in order to do that, I would like us to consider the capital E. So here we have Roman lettering from the Trajan column, which I believe was um, also uh, heavily influenced by lettering on Alexander the Great's tomb. So we look at this and immediately we recognize it. It's like, wow, nothing has changed in 2000 years. I know those letters. So it's worth asking the question, why has nothing changed in 2000 years? Second thing, you'll notice that all of these letters, apart from maybe four, if they were made out of wood in three dimensions, would stand up. There is that kind of symmetry and balance going on. So I need to tell you that this is not how the Romans wrote. Your average everyday Roman did not write like this. They had a, a much more a straightforward cursive form they used. So this is not Roman writing. This is Roman monumental writing. And in particular, because every Roman emperor was by definition a god, what you need is a writing form that is appropriate and suitable to a god. You need a writing form that, is, uh, that goes so far beyond what we do with our hands when we're writing that it is physically impossible to write like this without tools. So what you notice here are these virtues of Euclidean geometry. So we have parallel lines, we have right angles, we have symmetry all over the place, O symmetry, S symmetry, vertical symmetry, horizontal symmetry. All of these are ideal forms. They're ideal in the sense that uh, they're not kind of um, human. Um, I often do a thing when I'm giving talks where I have a, a poor volunteer who's willing to be um, embarrassed come up to the board and I say, will you please write us a capital E? And of course they think, well, of course I can do this. And they do a capital E. And then I say, actually, you know what? Could you make the horizontals equally spaced? And so they rub it out and do it. And I say, actually, 
you know, the vertical, it's, it's not quite vertical. And, and after a while, you realize this is not a human act. It's a mechanical act. And it's a mechanical act because it is writing fit for a god. And as such, we've inherited it because um, we look up to classical Rome and Greece as the origins for our wisdom, our knowledge, our learning. When, for example, right after the American Revolution, there was a vogue in architecture for building houses with columns and pillars and architraves or whatever those things are called, because this was the new democracy. America was, um, was following in the footsteps of democracy and therefore wanted to have architecture that said, new democracy. And, but if you think about it, those virtues of symmetry, of robustness, of, of um, um, stability, are the virtues of a military empire. They seem to be the virtues of reason to us, but they're also the virtues of um, uh, survival and lasting. So that they, they are balanced. They, um, they are not going to blow over or knock over easily. They are, they're the virtues of law and order, in fact. So now let's look at another E. Let's look at a different E. So this is from the Cham um, people of um, southern Vietnam. And what you can see is that there is no, there are no right angles, there are no straight lines. Uh, there's no symmetry, although there's a certain sense of balance, I suppose. Um, there are um, no horizontals and verticals. This is a different set of assumptions. And what I, the idea I want to leave you with in just a minute is that in writing, every curve and straight line tell a story. Every writing system in some way represents the culture and the technology and the sometimes even the climate and the vegetation of the people who used it or who's continued to use it. Um, and unless you understand that, then to design a type for that people, maybe to make certain mistakes or to encourage them to overlook their own understanding of their own script, because people don't usually think about this stuff, about their own, their own writing systems. Um, so this is this unbelievably graceful letter here, and as I say, the Cham E. And Alec, can you come back to, to me again, because I just wanna show something here, um, manually, literally. So if you wanted to draw that E in the air with your fingertip, this is what you would do. You would go like this, like this and like that, like this, like this and like that. It's the hand of a dancer. And what it really shows is that our writing system, especially the uppercase part of it, is, is really designed um, mechanically to be reproduced mechanically. There are many scripts around the world that are designed around the movement of the human wrist and elbow and as such in my personal opinion they are more human it's as if we feel the act of writing as we're reading them which means we feel the person who is doing the writing instead of it being a piece of writing it becomes a transaction it becomes a gift it becomes something which someone has done and offered to somebody else and I offer you that idea as somebody who is not a calligrapher or a type designer and just basically did this by carving it and had an idea. But I think it's an idea worth thinking about. Okay, so what we're going to do now is two things. First of all, I am going to repeat my pitch. If you think this talk has been a worthwhile use of your time um, and if you went to a movie and spent the same time as a movie, you would pay this much to go to a movie. Um, I really 
encourage, actually beseech you to go to the link you're going to see at the end of this whole thing and make a donation. Uh, you could also buy a copy of my book, Endangered Alphabets, which I'll sign before I send it to you. Second thing I would like to do is um, to say, I am really looking forward to your questions and observations and disagreements and whatnot. If there's talk going on, by all means, put your um, comments in chat um, so that uh, if there's time, Alec will pull them up and I'll, I'll answer them. If not, I'll see them after the show is over and I'll be happy to continue the conversation with you then. So, whew, uh, without further ado, I'm turning it over to you. And you can use the hands up function um, on your panel, um, or you can just like wave vigorously and Alec, I'm sure we'll see you, or you can use chat and you can say, hey, I have something I want to say, or I have a question I want to ask. There's a question in the chat now. Okay, what is it? Uh, how endangered does the script have to be to qualify? Ha! Ah, yes. So here's the thing. Um, because every nation carries out some kind of census, I mean, some of them are more accurate than others, some of them happen more often than others. And typically the census asks, what is your mother language, what, what language you speak, etc. We know fairly accurately how many people speak how many languages. And so it's not difficult to say, wow, if there are this number of speakers, it is this endangered. And if there are this number of speakers, it's this endangered, etc. And that's fine. Nobody, as far as I know, in any census in the world asks about writing systems. And so we have no good numbers whatsoever. So this is guesswork on my part. And the criterion are, the criteria are, one, is it used for official purposes? So if the government is putting out information about COVID, does it also go out in this minority script? Answer, almost never. Two, um, is it used in any kind of governmental um, process? For example, if someone wants to uh, kind of get involved in parliamentary debate, debate or legislative debate, can they do so using this script? Again, if it's a minority script, almost certainly no. Three, is it taught in schools as a medium of instruction? So there are some endangered scripts where kids can learn it for a year maybe, and typically they hate it because the teacher doesn't use it and doesn't know it very well and doesn't have much enthusiasm for it. And it's sort of like, yeah, 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 we're not gonna use this when we grow up, why should we know it now? So that's another endangering factor if it's not the medium of instruction in schools. Are there newspapers printed in it? Are there fonts available for it? Can you actually text somebody from your phone in that script? Or do you have to go through one of the privileged scripts of the first world in order to do so? Which means, of course, you know, the, uh, the quality of your thinking and your writing are not fully represented. So those are the criteria that I use. And ultimately, what it comes down to is, if there is a group, no matter how small, that is working to either revive a traditional script or support one that has been created recently for a particular culture, such as Manwego, then I'm there for them. I want to help them any way I can. And the way I'm helping them, apart from anything else, is by including them in my Atlas of Endangered Alphabets so that people know they're there. Um, we had someone from a very small minority um, group in India who said to one of our researchers, it means the world to us that we are seen. Because typically their neighbors look down on them, um, marginalize them, uh, despise them. So just to be seen outside in the world is a huge thing. Next. Okay, so from Rohan, we have how is the encoding of endangered scripts into Unicode doing? Um, so Unicode, 
There are several steps involved in the encoding of scripts in Unicode, and all of them require expertise and time. So, and I, and I know people who are in the middle of this process, and I know people who work for Unicode, so um, I'm not dissing anybody here. So first of all, you have to have somebody who knows the script well enough to be able to say, this is how it works. And typically that means a professional linguist, somebody who is able to demonstrate that the script completely meets the needs of the spoken language. So it can be, first of all, you need to bring someone in to do that usually. And secondly, that can be a process of a couple of years. Secondly, you have to then present that in a proposal to Unicode. And just beating the, 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 the information into the shape of the proposal is, it's like doing grant writing. It's a, it's a skill in itself. And that process um, can take a couple of years, especially as um, the people involved in Unicode or uh, any of their advisors will likely come back with questions and say, is that mark used for er or er? And, you know, so, you know, we, really we're thinking everything through. So that can take a couple of years. Once it's accepted into Unicode, it doesn't mean there are fonts or keyboards available for it. And so my mate Craig Cornelius over at Google is working with, um, for example, Cherokee to say, okay, we have a Cherokee font in Unicode, but we need to have the code written. That means that we can now actually type it on our keyboards or we can text it using our Android phones. So that whole process can easily take 10 years and requires several different sets of collaboration and skills. Um, so there are a number of scripts that are not yet encoded in Unicode. I can think of phew, probably a dozen at least, but bless them, there are a lot of people out there right now who are doing hard work, starting with the people on the ground, you know, in the language community, and then going all the way up to people involved in the script encoding initiative and, um, and Unicode and um, other um, sort of commercial operators uh, like Adobe and uh, Google who are getting involved as well. So it's a long process. For me, the, the, everything begins with the person on the ground, like Nolan Smoimwego, who is actually not only creating the script, but teaching it. You know, he's actually talking to people and promoting it and, you know, doing this stuff here. Um, speaking of which, Sebastian, come and join us. To, um, tell us more um, about your project. Okay, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, sure thing. Okay, so when I started with the Mwangwebo script project, I was actually inspired by the fact that uh, it's one of the few writing systems that uh, I could actually understand, uh, an African writing system that I could actually understand using my own local language, since it was created for mainly for the Bantu languages, which uh, are the same, practically the same here in Malawi and in Malawi and here in Zimbabwe. And uh, with that, I looked at other writing systems as well like the Litema uh, Tsadinoko from South Africa and the Mandombe script from DRC Congo. But uh, looking at those, the, especially the Mandombe script was a bit, uh, it was a bit uh, difficult for, to understand, per se. And also the resources on it, uh, on trying to understand it and trying to learn it were a bit scarce, uh, unlike um, the Mwangwebo script. I actually had, um, a bit of understanding to it was a bit easy to understand how to decode it and use it for for Shona. So uh, when when I initially when I saw it, uh, I didn't know about the Unicode and all that stuff. I just thought you know you make your own writing system like a proper writing system and then uh, stuff works just like that. And then it's only when I started learning type design. Um, that I actually tried, started to understand that you actually have to get your an actual font encoded. And then I further discovered that the Nguangwebo script was actually not encoded into the Unicode. But then instead of sitting around uh, waiting for it to be encoded into the Unicode consortium, I started working. Um, I thought of an idea 
like how can I bring this to to the world? Because uh, the other thing was that most of these African scripts are, are actually well known, unlike the Mwangwebo script. So I actually thought, how how best can I can I bring this to the world? And then um, I thought of an idea of creating uh, uh, type designs, not type designs per se, but uh, yeah, exactly type designs with with decorations. And then with these decorations, I chose um, patterns, African patterns, inspired by uh, everything that I see around, like the traditional uh, Tonga patterns from here in Zimbabwe, and the traditional Sh uh, Shona patterns as well that we find on hats, on clay pots, on uh, spears, and a lot of traditional stuff. And then using those elements, I started, you know, uh, embedding them onto the onto the uh, outline of the Nwangwego script, and without distorting any the, the the actual outline of the of the script, and yeah, that was basically it. Um, and so far, I think it's going well because I think a, a lot of people have been getting in touch with me and trying to understand, uh, learning more about about the Nwangwego script, including yourself. And I think so far it has been going on really well, and I just hope that very soon it will be encoded into the Unicode Consortium. And I really look forward to making a font for it. I'm actually in the process of making a font for it, but I'm sure it will be a very bumpy process because since it's not yet encoded, it's going to be a really huge problem trying to use it in actual applications. But yeah, I'm also in the process of making a font for, for the Mamoibo for script. And they've um, spoken to me. Um, so, yeah. So I have um, There are a couple of people that I can put you in touch with. So when the show is over, I, I mm -hmm. will put you in touch with both of them who are involved in the process of um, getting fonts ready for Unicode proposals and also okay. getting Unicode fonts ready for, um, uh, for commercial use. So okay, that's, that great. that's great. Um, yeah. Well done. Um, we got time for a couple more questions. Who else wants to jump in? Sure. I put a question in chat. Yes. So um, Alec has a question in chat. Um, Alec is not the most forthcoming or obnoxious of people. And so the fact that he's actually put a question in chat means he actually probably doesn't want to appear on screen. So I'm going to read it out. I imagine it's difficult enough to get one font done for an endangered alphabet, but when one gets done, is that often a sort of tipping point after which more fonts get created for that script? And does that often lead to more fanciful interpretations of that script? Or when one font gets created, does that often represent a sort of stopping point where everyone just uses that one font and that's that. So I have an answer to that um, from the stuff that I've seen going on around the world. Does anybody else want to jump in with an answer to that from what you've seen? Okay, Olish, go for it. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So it, it, it's from my point of view, it really depends on the kind of uh, script it is. Because there are scripts, like you just mentioned, Mongolian, which is ah, very unique in a way. But then, if you notice how it is written, especially the calligraphy you've shown, it shows great influence of Chinese. So there are fonts within the family of fonts that are using the most of the available types for font. Uh, there are alphabets from many, for a family of writing scripts, written scripts, that are using the all kind of fonts that are available for that family. But then there are separate standing fonts, like I guess, uh, well, like Amazigh, for example, or, uh, or, or other, other alphabets that, that actually have to create their own. And depends of the, of the number of people, I guess. There are, there, there are things that are just created and there's not many users that do, they'll stay the way they are. But then if you, are, you have some users that are, are artistically inclined, just like Sebastian, I guess, that sooner or later they'll have one, two or three fonts. And it does depend on the inclination of the users. 
So I guess if if it is not some kind of appropriation, we can actually design phones and if they are used, then they'll be used. Um, great, great answer. So, um, I actually have seen, uh, I want to take a couple of examples that we've mentioned briefly up to now. So a lot of it comes down, not surprisingly, to money. Um, so, you know, passion and time are obviously vital, but um, what's really clear in Morocco, for example, is that now the government has said um, public signage needs to be in Arabic and in the Latin script, typically in the French language and in Tivenach, then all of a sudden that gives designers an opportunity to say, okay, um, I've been asked to design a, um, a neon sign to go all the way across the front of the Mohammed V airport. And so that is going to be one kind of font. And then somebody else is um, doing a font, uh, you know, doing a sign that's going outside an elementary school. So there's all of a sudden there's a range of opportunities. The second, and, and of course, we also saw that now that there are school books coming out, then you've got kid friendly fonts that are developing. The other thing you, that you see in Indonesia, which is quite different, is that by and large, the islands vary a great deal in their level of tourism. And so the more tourism there is in a given island, let's say Bali, for example, then all of a sudden the traditional script has that kind of tourist attraction because it says, you know, we are old, we are ancient, we have this deep, rich culture, etc. And so a number of commercial enterprises such as hotels or restaurants will commission fonts um, in the Balinese script or a range of Balinese scripts that then get used for these purposes. If you go further out into the islands, into areas which are less visited by tourists, you see that happening much less. So um, going back to Alex's question, um, I think you only ever get um, a standard um, where a font is created and then everything stops, either when there's some kind of governmental repression going on or where there is a, a real lack of resources. And that's the only one that's available. But I have to say that even in really small minority communities with relatively few resources, you're getting people designing fonts and then designing their own Wikipedia page, for example. Um, it really, fonts are the new frontier in the way that the printing press reduced the range of fonts because people only wanted to invest in the most popular typefaces. The internet has done the opposite. It's actually made expressiveness through writing that much more um, uh, possible. Okay, we have another question on chat. Uh, Brent, tell us, uh, uh, do you wanna, do you wanna uh, ask your question out loud or should I read it off the, the chat? Parent, yeah, parent, parent Papazian. Um, it's not a question. I was uh, saying that um, adults are kind of satisfied with one font, unless they're designers. So, but when children see their new script, their uh, their own script on their devices, etc., then their creative minds are more prone in the future to want more variety, want, want more style. So I think that maybe it's a long-term thing, but you know, the first font plants a seed, and then maybe the next generation uh, is the one that really ramps up the font. I think you're exactly right. And this is uh, the whole business of having more fonts available for even standard um, PCs in the United States was driven by kids. Um, there's this wonderful New Yorker cartoon, which I think speaks to everything that we're talking about, where, um, and this, this cartoon came out in about 2007. Um, and it's a, like an elementary school classroom, so all the kids are sitting looking up at the front, and the teacher is looking down at this small boy who is maybe, oh, I don't know, 10. And, small boy is holding the paper, his, you know, papers in his hand, but he's looking over the top of them at the class. And he says, 
Before I read my book report, I'd like to discuss my font choice with you. And you're right. I mean, it was, the, it was kids who first started saying this, you know, this, I'm writing a paper about Australia. Is there an Australian font that I can use? You know, I'm writing a paper that's angry. Can I print it out in red? Um, and uh, it was only kind of secondary and higher education that said, no, you must turn in your papers in Times New Roman because that's the thing that is like intellectually stable and shows that you've learned how to be an adult. Um, and, I, and of course, all of that is breaking down now. Um, it, this is a time of uh, wonderful um, expression and, and explosion. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you so much for your questions and your comments. Um, uh, as I say, all of the links that we've talked about are going to go out on the email that will go out to all of you. Um, the slide is going to come up, which tells you where you can make a contribution to um, this uh, series and to the Endangered Alphabets Project. Um, uh, www.endangeredalphabets.com and you'll see a tab that says support our work and you can click on that. I'm so glad um, to have um, had uh, all of you join us. And um, if for any reason you want to recommend this, um, Alec is probably already doing the conversion of the recording to YouTube. So the link um, for where the YouTube recording will be is going to go out within the next 24 hours. Um, I wish you all the best. Um, I hope that um, you stay well and healthy. And the next talk, which is going to be on Wednesday, is going to be like the partner talk to this. It's going to be about endangered alphabets and art. And I have things to say about that, which will blow your mind, he said, modestly. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.